Hello to you. I do hope you're well. Welcome to this A-level religious studies revision video. I'm Ben Waddle and today we are asking what is the doctrine of double effect and of course we'll be talking about this in the context of St Thomas Aquinas. So we will be asking what is the doctrine of double effect and we'll be looking at some case study examples. So we'll be looking to apply it to some contemporary ethical issues. And we'll be asking, does it work? Is the doctrine of double effect successful? And then what do different scholars think about it? So let's get started, shall we? So first of all, whenever we're talking about the doctrine of double effect, we are tracing it back to St. Thomas Aquinas, who was known as the Doctor Angelicus, the angelic doctor in the Catholic Church. Um, and he was the author of Summa Theologica, which is a momentous piece of theology, which will probably take you about 200 years to read. So, you know, if you get started now, you'll still be going in a good few hundred years. He was an Italian uh, Dominican friar and priest. He was a philosopher and theologian. And he is not only a philosopher and theologian, but he is also considered one of the Catholic Church's greatest. So he has been hugely influential in terms of shaping Catholic thinking, Catholic theology and philosophy, especially ethical issues. You know, his natural moral law has been very influential on the Catholic Church. And so his ideas continue to influence the ethical thinking of, you know, hundreds of millions of people today, if you think. There are 1.2 billion Catholics in the world. You know, Aquinas has shaped many of the ethical views and ideas that they hold and subscribe to today. So he was influenced by Aristotle. You may know that, of course. So in terms of Aristotle's ideas about a prime mover, Aristotle's ideas about telos and about the world having purpose very heavily influenced and he tried to bring together those church teachings that he inherited that he was familiar with and then the ancient Greek philosophy of Aristotle and that's why we very much see him as a philosopher and theologian he was bringing together those Christian ideas and Christian scripture bringing that together with the ideas that he was reading in Aristotle's work and then as I've mentioned he is responsible for Christian natural moral law with those five primary precepts, for example. But today we're going to focus on his doctrine of double effect. And very simply, the doctrine of double effect is invoked, so it's brought up, it is used to explain the permissibility of an action that causes a serious harm. So it's used to explain why an action that causes serious harm may actually be permitted or justified or acceptable, such as the death of a human being. And the way this is done is it explains that serious harm, that action that causes serious harm as a side effect of promoting some good end. And so as I've put here, and this is really important, it is based on the idea that there is a morally relevant difference between an intended consequence of an act and one that is foreseen by the actor but not calculated to achieve their motive. And all that that means is there is a significant difference between intentions and foreseeing something. So let me just visualize that for you. Aquinas believes there is a big difference between intention and foresight. So intention is when you consciously choose to do something and you aspire to do something. You know, if I have the intention to punch you, which of course I do not, but you know, say I did. If I, if I have the intention to punch you, then that is me saying, that is what I want to do. That is the purpose of the action. I am going to achieve that. Whereas foresight is where you can foresee something, you know that something is going to happen, but you don't necessarily want it to, or you don't necessarily plan for it to happen. So, you know, for example, I could have the foresight that if you were in a fight, you, you could get punched. 
I'm not saying I want you to get punched, but I'm simply aware of the fact it could happen. And he says there is a morally significant difference between these two things, between having an intention and then just having foresight that something could happen. And I think when we start to apply these to some concrete examples, they will make a little bit more sense. But just for now, really important that you know, Aquinas distinguishes between intention, having the intention to do something and foresight, simply being aware that something may happen, but not necessarily intending for it to happen, not consciously wanting it to happen. So. Aquinas introduces the doctrine of double effect using the example of self-defense, and he writes in Summa Theologica this, nothing hinders one act from having two effects, only one of which is intended. So he says, with any act, there could be two effects, but only one of them may have been intended. He said, accordingly, the act of self-defense may have two effects. One, the saving of one's life, the other, the slaying of the aggressor. Therefore, this act, since one's intention is to save one's life, is not unlawful. So what is Aquinas saying here? Well, he's saying, think about self-defense. So if somebody attacks you, you may hit them back because you are trying to defend yourself. Now he is saying that one act can be seen as having two um, effects. On the one hand, it's defending you, but on the other hand, it's going to cause harm to somebody else. And Aquinas is saying, what is your intention here? In acting out of self-defense, what is your intention? You can foresee that by striking out, you are going to harm somebody, but he says, but what's the actual intention? And if the intention is to defend yourself, then that act is justified because the intention is not to cause them harm. The intention is to protect and preserve your life. And of course, the preservation of life is one of Aquinas' five primary precepts of natural moral law. And so he says, if that person then died as a result of you striking them, it would not actually be unlawful because your intention was not to harm them. Your intention was not to kill them. Your intention was simply to preserve your life, to protect yourself. And so Aquinas would say in that case, since one's intention is to save one's life, that act is not unlawful. And so here we have the birth, if you like, of the doctrine of double effect. And we'll be taking a look at some other examples of how this can be applied in contemporary ethics. But just for now, it's so important to know this distinction between intention and foresight. So here's some more um quotes that I've found for you from some more contemporary philosophers that I think help us to understand what the doctrine of double effect is all about. So Lewis Pogman said, it is always wrong to do a bad act intentionally in order to bring about some good consequences, but it is sometimes permissible to do a good act despite knowing that it will bring about bad consequences. So again, self-defense, you can say it's a good act. You know that somebody else may be harmed in the process. You have the foresight to see that, but it's a good act because you're defending yourself. You're preserving life. On the other hand, though, it is always wrong to do a bad act intentionally in order to bring about good consequences. So you cannot intentionally do a bad act by saying, oh, well, the end justifies the means. You know, I've, I've got good consequences in mind so I can do anything. He, Aquinas, is very concerned with your intention. And so it is permissible to do a good act despite knowing that it will bring about potentially bad consequences. And then Philippa Fott has a great way of um, summarizing this. She says, the doctrine of the double effect is based on a distinction between what a man foresees as a result of his voluntary action and what, in the strict sense, he intends. So again, this key distinction between intention and foresight. What are you intending to do? That is what matters. That is where we're going to be making our moral judgment about you. If you have foresight that something bad could happen as a side effect, that is not the same as having the intention to 
be the cause of that badness, if that makes sense. So it's all about this distinction between intention and foresight. So another philosopher for you, Anthony Kenny, he said, Anthony Kenny said, I believe that a principle of double effect must form part of any rational system of morality, and it has many everyday applications. There are cases when it makes a huge difference, whether an outcome is intended or merely foreseen. So again, there is that key distinction between intention and foresight. Now, he actually gives us a really good example here. It's that good. I've had to put it in a yellow speech bubble. This is how important it is. So just have a listen to this. He said, for instance, there is nothing wrong with appointing the best person for the job, even though you know that by doing so, you will give pain to the other candidate. So the other candidates are going to be upset that they didn't get the job. But that is a side effect. And so it's not your problem. It is a side effect of you doing something good and that goodness was giving the right person the best person the job and so even though you had the foresight that the other candidates who didn't get the job would be upset that was only foresight it was not your intention to upset them your intention was to appoint the best person for the job their upset their pain is merely a side effect of that. It was foreseeable, but it was not your primary intention. However, he then says it would be a very different matter if you appointed candidate A, um, even though they were the best candidate for the express purpose of giving pain to B. So if you appointed somebody with the intention of upsetting the person who you didn't appoint, that would be a bad thing. Even if you were still appointing the best person for the job, if your intention in appointing them was to upset the person who didn't get the job, then that would be a very different matter, as he says. So again, it's all about your intention. What is the intention behind what you're doing? What is the as I'm, I'm going to repeat myself, what is the intention that you have and you hold? Do you have a good intention? And this is where we're making our moral judgment. We're assessing your morality in terms of your intention. Now, Mangan gives us four conditions for the doctrine of double effect. And I find these very, very helpful for actually understanding in very concrete terms how this applies. So these are the conditions, as I say, put forwards for the doctrine of double effect. And you will find these in most of your textbooks. And if you do a quick Google about the doctrine of double effect, you will find these four conditions that are required for the doctrine of double effect. So we're going to talk through them now. All four, the nature of the act, the means end, the right intention, and the proportion, I can't speak, excuse me, the proportionality condition. So here we are. Number one is the nature of the act condition. And very simply, the action itself must be morally good or indifferent slash neutral. So remember before how I said you can't do a bad act for a good consequence. The action itself must be morally good or at the very least morally neutral. So the nature of the act itself. So this is kind of a little bit deontological, isn't it? Because it's saying the act itself must be good or at the very least neutral. The second condition then is the means end condition. The bad effect must not be the means by which the good effect is achieved. So the bad effect that cannot be the means by which the good effect is achieved. So if we're saying that there may be a potential, a potentially bad side effect, that cannot be the way in which we achieve the good effect. The act itself has to still be good or at least morally neutral. The third one is the right intention condition. The intention must only be to achieve the good effect. And, you know, that's what we've been emphasizing on in this video so far. Your intention versus foresight. Your intention must be pure. Your intention must only be to achieve the good effect. You can be aware that there may be negative side effects. You can have that foresight, but you cannot have the intention that they come to fruition. You can be aware of them, but you must not have the intention to achieve them. The intention must solely be on achieving the good effect. And then finally, number four is the proportionality condition. 
the idea that the good effect must at least be equivalent in importance to the bad effect. So the bad side effect cannot outweigh the good intended effect, if that makes sense. So, you you know, you cannot say, right, well, you know, the good effect I intend is justified by having some massive bad side effect. You know, it's got to be in proportion. You've got to be contributing to an overall goodness in the end. So the good needs to be in a higher proportion than any bad, unintended, but foreseeable side effects. So let's apply this, shall we? Let's see how this actually works. As I've said, Aquinas proposed this application to self-defense. And he said that nothing hinders one act from having those two effects, only one of which is intended. The other is foreseeable, but not intentional. Accordingly, the act of self-defense may have two effects. One, the saving of one's life, the other, the slaying of the aggressor. Therefore, this act, since one's intention is to save one's life, is not unlawful. And so, as I've put here, your intention, excuse me, in striking out is to preserve your life. That is your priority. That is your complete intention. You have not gone out looking to start trouble. I want to hit someone today. I want to harm someone today. That is not your intention. Your intention in this action is simply and solely to preserve your life. You don't want to get revenge on them. You don't want to show them who's boss. You literally just want to preserve your life. And so the death of the attacker in this situation would simply be a side effect of this. So that is really important that Aquinas says, your intention is to save your own life. It's about the preservation of your life. So it's not unlawful. As I say, if you then had other intentions there that you want to prove to him who's boss or you want to give him, you know, a taste of his own medicine, actually, then that action, you know, its goodness is diluted. It, it's not going to meet the criteria for Aquinas. If your intention is to save your life and that is the entire intention behind striking out, then, you know, the death of the attacker would be a side effect of this. And in terms of the proportionality criteria, Aquinas would be saying, well, the preservation of one's own life outweighs the unfortunate, unfortunate side effect of your attacker losing their life. Because as a human being, you've got that primary duty for the preservation of your life. OK, another application and quite an interesting one is to tactical bombing. So we could make the distinction between a terror bomber, so a terrorist, and then a uh, tactical bomber who is part of a war effort, for example. And so we're again going to focus on the same action. It's about them committing the same action but having different intentions, again, reflecting the fact that the doctrine of double effect is all about intentions. So the terror bomber aims to bring about civilian deaths in order to weaken the resolve of the enemy when he bombs civilians. Uh, this is the consequence that he intends. So that's what the terror bomber wants to do. He wants to kill civilians, innocent civilians. On the other hand, the tactical bomber aims at military targets, okay? So their intention is not to harm civilians. They aim at military targets whilst foreseeing that bombing such targets will cause civilian death. So remember our key distinction between intention and foresight. When his bombs kill civilians, this is a foreseen, but um, that should say unintended consequence. Do excuse me for the typo there in the most critical part of the paragraph as well. But remember, when it is um, the um, tactical bomber, when the bombs kill civilians, that's terrible, isn't it? This is a foreseen but unintended consequence. Even if it is equally certain that the two bombers will cause the same number of civilian deaths, terror bombing is impermissible while tactical bombing is permissible because of the intentions. And of course, Aquinas as well, you know, he's got such an enormous influence on Catholic thinking, is a key proponent of just war theory. He is responsible for Catholic just war theory. So again, we're seeing his influence here. What can be justified? What cannot? And of course, just war criteria says innocent civilians must not be targeted. 
A tactical bomber who is aiming at military targets as part of the just war effort is not intending to kill civilians. And so that could be justifiable, whereas the terrorist bomber who solely wants to kill civilians, that cannot be justified. Again, it all comes down to the intention. And of course, one of our key evaluation points is going to be, well, how do you actually assess or prove intention? So let me give you another example, the example of uterine cancer. So a pregnant woman is diagnosed with uterine cancer, cancer of the uterus. It is permissible, the doctrine of double effect would say, to remove the cancerous uterus. And so therefore also terminating the pregnancy if this is the only way to stop the spread of the cancer. And if the doctor does not intend to end the pregnancy only to remove the cancer. So this is really important because of course, this would lead to the loss of the, the um, developing um, baby's life. It, it's, it's going to lead to their death, to the termination of the pregnancy because you are removing the uterus. But here's the thing with the doctrine of double effect. If the doctor's only intention is to save the mother's life by stopping that cancer spreading, then it can be justifiable, it can be acceptable for, as, as a bad side effect of that procedure, of that life-saving procedure, for the pregnancy to be terminated. Now, what's really important here is that we are not saying that the doctor can decide on an abortion because it's justified by the end of saving the mother's life. That is not what's going on here. It is this idea that the good effect, the removal of the cancer does not follow from the bad effect, the termination of the pregnancy. You're not terminating the pregnancy to save the mother's life. And this is a common misconception with the doctrine of double effect. You are doing a good act. You are removing the cancerous uterus in order to save the mother's life. And then as a bad side effect of that, the pregnancy is terminated. But the doctor's intention is to remove the cancerous uterus. And so then as that side effect, a foreseeable side effect, of course, the doctor knows what's going to happen. But as that side effect, the pregnancy would then also be terminated. Now, another example of this is the, uh, the ectopic pregnancy example, where the fertilized egg implants in a uh, fallopian tube rather than the womb. The egg itself then will not be able to grow into, into a baby. But also, if that ectopic pregnancy is allowed to continue, the mother's life is at serious risk risk. So again, a doctor may be justified in their intention to remove the fallopian tube, um, which is risking the mother's life, which is becoming a risk to the mother's life, with the side effect that the pregnancy is then terminated as well. So again, it's about what is their intention? What is the primary purpose of what's going on here? And that can then justify a bad side effect okay another example that i think will help us to get our heads around this is um the application to decisions that hasten death so this is the case where a doctor treats a terminally ill patient by giving a dose of painkiller with the intention of relieving their increasing pain ultimately and here's that important word again it is not unforeseeable that continuing to increase the amount of the painkiller may hasten the death of the patient However, this would be an unintended, although not unforeseen, consequence of the action. So again, that key distinction we started with between intention and foresight. What is the doctor's intention? Their intention is to relieve this person's increasing pain. They can foresee that by continuing to increase the dose of this drug, that will hasten their death, but... The intention and the good effect is relieving pain. That's the primary purpose. It's not saying let's kill them to relieve their pain. It's saying let's do everything we can to relieve their pain with foresight of the side effect of that, with awareness, with foresight of what will also happen as a result but again it's not saying let's kill them to relieve their pain it's saying let's increase the dose of their painkiller with foresight of what will happen as a result of that 
So again, this really clear distinction. And that is why I have not used the word euthanasia there and why I did not use the word abortion earlier, because you've got to be very careful with the doctrine of double effect that you're not saying that bad actions can be justified by good outcomes. It's all about the intention. It's all about intention versus foresight. Now, this brings me on to the evaluation questions I want to leave you with today. So I've got three questions I want you to start thinking about when it comes to the doctrine of double effect. The first one is this. Are we not responsible for all the consequences of all our actions, whether we intended them or not? So actually, even if your intention was just to relieve their pain, if they have died as a result of what you've done, are you not responsible for that anyway? You know, and if, if we're think, talking about self-defense as well, you know, are we not responsible for the fact that you, you have just killed somebody? Yeah, okay, your intention was solely to defend yourself, but your action has still killed somebody. So surely you are still responsible for that. So, you know, it, it's trying to think, how does the doctrine of double effect actually work? Next one I'd ask you is, how can you actually prove your intention? Could people use the doctrine of double effect as a bit of a get out of jail free card because they could simply say, well, it wasn't my intention to kill them. My intention was simply to relieve their pain. So actually, you know, how does this work in practice? How can we prove it? How can we verify and check morality when it comes to the doctrine of double effect? Could it become, as I say, a little bit of an excuse, a little bit of an escape from justice? And then I'm going to ask you this final question as well. Should we not judge morality based on actions rather than intentions? So because we cannot really see people's intentions, we just have to take what they say their intention was as true. Should we not judge morality based on what we can see, which is actions? Should it not be based on the actions themselves rather than the intentions behind them? So there is our introduction to the doctrine of double effect. I hope that's been helpful. If you've got any thoughts, you've got any examples, then please do leave them in the comments down below. But thank you for watching. Good luck with your studies and have a very good day. Take care. Bye bye.